With the ridge, we, we saw that the ridge makes some of the thetas go down to zero. Um, I think Matt showed you that uh, plot and I'm about to show it to you again. However, what we want, we would like is a technique that makes some of the thetas truly go to zero. That's going to be the topic of um, this lecture that I'm starting now. Okay, so in particular, think of a problem where you have many axes, many predictors, okay. Each of these predictors gets multiplied by a theta. And then it predicts a y. In particular, for linear regression, we know that y hat is equal to x1 times theta1 plus x2 times theta2 plus <coughs> xd times theta d. Okay. Now, it might be that some of these axes are things we don't want to measure for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, they might be too expensive. And so what we would love is for some of these to go to zero. Okay? Because imagine that x1, so x1 is expensive. Okay. Imagine that x1 also does not contribute to good predictions. Okay. Then we want Because if theta 1 goes to 0 in my model, like imagine that I, I find out that this is 0. If theta 1 is 0, there's no point in me measuring x1, right? Because any number times 0 will be 0. So we, this is the game that we're going to play. We're going to take all the inputs, the d inputs. We will fit a model. We're going to use a regularizer that will set some of these thetas to 0. And once the thetas are 0, we can drop those variables. So the variables associated with 0, we remove. So like in this case, theta 1 is 0. That means we don't need x1. Oh, I had forgotten this annoying thing. Welcome back. <laughs> I have God knows how many minutes for questions. So <laughs> let's have an informal session here of questions about any of the material of the last week until the projector comes up. Yeah. Um, and we were um, looking at the example with there was a schematic of um, a bunch of Gaussians on their side, and the, the maximum likelihood estimate was interpreted as the sum of the product differences, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and the schematic was there because the way that we optimize, so we're trying to optimize like the, the total probability, but, but the, all the data points are related through those parameters. Is not a theta one for two D example, um, but I didn't understand that that schematic because, um, like, it seems they're all the same instance. So why would they be going up? I don't understand that. It seems like you could order them in different ways. So is it, why is a line? Why are they lying on the line? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get that. 
So um, let's see if I uh, can answer your question. So this time I'm going to get more colors. So the assumption is that you, we have several data. So we have x1 to n. And for each data, we have n labels. So n points, x, and n labels, uh, y. Um, the assumption is that these are all what, what I call i, i, d, which means that they're all from the same distribution. Um, in particular, in this case, they're all i, d, Gaussian. So they all come from the same distribution with the same variance. And, um, and what, what that means is that um, if they're independent, I'm essentially saying that p of y1 to n given x1 to n, if the y's are independent, can be modeled. Okay, first, I'll do the math as a product over i of p of yi given xi. So the graphical model that I have for this is that I have x1 and y1. And then I also have x2 and y2, xn and yn. So my graphical model is actually a product of these independent graphical models as opposed to a single graphical model. There is, however, a common thing to them, which is theta. Okay. They're all different, but they all share the same theta. And it is that common theta that makes the points have a structure. In particular, if you have a line, that theta happens to be the, the slope and the intercept. So given theta, given your theta, which is consists of the slope and the intercept, then there is structure to the data. The points themselves are AID. But they, there is, the reason why you do get structure because they, they share a common parameter. So you're plotting that? The relation must be the same. The relation between each of the axes must be the same which is different than to say that they are dependent on each other. Now that I have the beauty of the projector, I'm going to move on to the projector. And I can continue with this example after class. OK, so. So Matt showed you, going back to the uh, ridge, he showed you the plot on the left. He basically says, as you increase delta square, or, or you minimize this t of delta, which you could think of it as 1 over delta square. So think of this eg as 1 over delta square. It could be some other function. We don't need to know what that function is. Um, but it's just a function that's uh, by increasing delta squared, um, it goes down. And so as delta squared becomes very large, so larger delta squared would be going left. As you increase delta squared, you, you get closer to zero because the ridge basically is a trade-off between theta transpose theta and y minus x theta. So that delta, by increasing to 0, you're basically saying the most important thing is to fit theta, is to minimize theta transpose theta. The only way you can minimize that is by setting theta to 0. In other words, what I'm saying is, if your cost function is y minus x theta 
And I'm going to do the 1D case here, plus delta squared theta squared. If that's my cost function, and if delta is huge, then the only way I can make that cost function vanish is by making theta very tiny. And that's why as we increase delta, you see that the, the thetas go to zero. Okay, they become small. Over here we would have when delta is equal eventually very large, so when delta is very small, you, you're back to maximum likelihood. Now, the techniques that we're going to look at today actually do a bit better than this. Because this technique will make, for example, this guy here is getting very close to zero, but it's not zero. It will be 0 0.01 or 0 0.1. And so we then have to decide when should we get rid of something? When is something small enough? And that creates problems. The new technique will be such that when you have something like age, for example, here of the patient, it will automatically set theta to zero. So theta seven will become equal to zero for this particular value of delta. And then there is some optimal value of delta that we find by cross-validation. And that optimal value of delta, we find out that there's only three things that we need to measure. And if we only measure those three things, we can get a good prediction. That is the best possible prediction on the test set. So instead of using eight variables, we just use those three variables, and we can give the user, the patient, a much simpler questionnaire. And then avoid doing blood tests and all sorts of expensive things. Oh, I haven't told you how to do this. I'm telling you this is what I want. I've, uh, Matt has told you how to get the ridge on the left. I want to get the guy on the right. I want to have a technique that will set thetas to zero. We already have one that gives us thetas that are very close to zero, and that's ridge regression. I want to do better than ridge. I've already, Matt has already argued that ridge is better than maximum likelihood, and I argued it gives you better confidence estimates and so on. Now I want to go further. I want to actually do even better than the ridge. And when I do better, not only will I do better predictions or comparable predictions, but I actually want to also select the important variables automatically. Okay? If I'm classifying documents, and uh, for the document, each feature, each input might be whether a different word is present or not, in which case the input might be a two million dimensional vector. I want to know which are all the words in English that are actually important in order to predict whether an email is spam or not. And, and that's sort of very important because it makes me, allows me to write much more efficient code to the spam filtering. Even on the graph on the left, some thetas do cross to zero at some point. For example, in the graph on the left, there's a vertical line, right? Uh, where yes, so, so this, think of this vertical line as also the, the maybe the, the best delta that you found. At that particular value of delta, this was your optimal value of delta, which you found by doing cross-validation, say. And at that value, some, some theta was very close to zero. It doesn't look like zero. Like LCP, it looks like 0 0.001. From what I'm I mean, it looking at it. the line of zero. At some point, it is zero, right? Oh, at some point, it crosses zero, but then it goes up. Like, for example, H. Um, yeah, on the right hand side, you just have. Yeah, but the point is crossing zero doesn't mean it's zero, because for a different value of delta, it's not zero. It's only zero for a very specific value of delta. Whereas the one on the right is much better. The one on the right is saying that. All of these guys, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, um, these two guys here, they, let me make sure I get the right ones. Sorry, it's this one and this one, not this one. It's saying that all those guys are precisely zero. They're not things that are, 
Pardon? And stay zero for larger values? Yes, they stay zero. Okay. They stay all at zero. Once they hit zero, they stay zero. And that's what I would like to do because then, then, then there is no thresholds, there's no heuristics. There's zero. And if there's zero, I can get rid of them. Okay, so I'm going to show you the picture today. And then in the next class, I will derive the algorithm for you. And then next week, you get to code this algorithm. And you actually try it on some data, and you'll see that actually will do a lot better than rich. Okay. Um, let's do it in 2D. Oops. And the technique is called the lasso when it's applied to linear regression. So what I'm going to define is an objective j of theta that's going to be equal to y minus x theta transpose y minus x theta. But I'm going to add to it, instead of adding theta squared, I'm going to add to it the absolute values of each of the thetas. So instead of adding theta squared, I add the absolute values of the thetas. In 2D, if I have theta, I would have theta is equal to theta 1 and theta 2. And so if I look at this equation here on the right with 2, I would basically have theta 1 plus theta 2. If I want to look at the contour plots of that function, I would equate it to a constant. So I want to know the points at which this is constant. And the absolute value has two solutions, plus or minus x, because the absolute value of minus 2 is the same as the absolute value of 2. So all my solutions to this problem are of the form theta 1 plus theta 2 theta 1 minus theta 2 equal const. And finally, minus theta 1 plus theta 2 equal const. So I have the equations of four lines. If I plot this, this term here is the usual quadratic that we've seen before, where this point here is the theta maximum likelihood. But if I plot now this other equation, this part here, which is the same as this for the 2D case, I have four lines. One line, another line, and another line. The significance of this is that the intersection point in this case of <coughs> the quadratic and this shape, the diamond shape, is very likely to be at the corner. Now the corners are at zero. And you can convince yourselves, you know, just take one of these guys and take a circular guy and if you had to drop this circle on the plane and look at the intersection, most of the time would be hitting one of the corners. So at this point here, theta 2 is equal to 0. 
And so now I still have a whole set of solutions. I have a whole regularization path. But for most of the time, it's at zero. Unlike the ridge, where it's small but not zero. <laughs>